Hello and welcome to The Diverse Bookshelf with me, Samia Aziz. On this show, I interview incredible authors doing a deep dive into important themes and issues while talking all things books. Today's guest is one of the funniest, warmest and most inspirational women I know. Sukh Ojla, a comedian, actor and writer, published her first book, Sunny, in the summer of 2022. I absolutely adored her novel, finding in the pages a character that was so much like me and absolutely hilarious, sweet and kind while struggling with life as she turns 30. I'm so glad to be speaking with Sook on the show today. As a comedian, Sook has performed on many TV shows including The Big Asian Stand-Up Show, Comedy Guide to Life, Jonathan Ross's Comedy Club, Comedy Central Live and she features in Sky's Dating No Filter. In 2019, Sook took her debut solo show, For Sook's Sake, to Edinburgh, which received rave reviews including five stars from Funny Women. This year, Sook returned to her nationwide tour of Life Sucks to critical acclaim. Television credits include The Feel Good, Channel 4, Bridgerton, The End of the Effing World, Game Face, Hospital People, Black Mirror and EastEnders. Hi, Sook. Thank you so much for joining me on the Diverse Bookshelf today. I am so thrilled to have you here. I cannot wait to talk about all things sunny and you and comedy. How are you doing today? Oh, thank you so much. I'm good. I am like all sensible people not leaving the house because it's January and it's cold and I don't leave the house unless I need to. So it's either work or a food related emergency. So as I have none of those things on today, <laughs> I'm staying cozy under a pile of blankets. Oh, that sounds perfect. I'm also under a pile of blankets. So that's great. Um, I want to start off by talking about your debut novel. So I mean, you are actually uh, a comedian and an actor by profession, but you are also yeah. a published author. And I read Sunny last year. And it came out in the summer as well. And I just felt like it was such a lovely kind of sweet, but also really heart wrenching and relatable read. And I loved the character of Sunny. I do wish she was real, but I feel like I'm also Sunny and lots of people yeah. I know are Sunny and you're probably also Sunny. Um, yeah. so tell, tell us about the novel. Yeah, so Sunny is very loosely the character is very loosely based on me when I turn 30 so Sunny is a woman who is kind of coming of age at a time when most people have their all their stuff together um, and she definitely doesn't so she's 30 she's moved back in with her parents her you know, quite traditional Sikh Punjabi parents and all of her friends are they seem to be doing grown-up things like getting married and buying houses and you know doing their shopping in John Lewis and M&S and she's like oh I still love a pound shop haul and she's still she's working in a job that she doesn't really like so she kind of feels like she's being left behind um she's also single and she's trying to find the one but she's dating on the down low uh you know so she's got to hide that from her traditional kind of quite conservative parents and she's also unbeknownst to her struggling with some mental health stuff that's going on for her but she doesn't really know what you know what's kind of she's doesn't really know what's going on or whether that's uh depression or so yeah so she's kind of she's not in the best place but she's still warm and friendly and funny and kind of yeah great fun to kind of be around yeah and really like she's really hopeful as well about mm. the future that that she wants for herself and that she wants for those around her as well and yeah. I um I think I really appreciate this sort of like nuanced presentation of what happens when you turn 30 the pressure there's mm. this huge pressure on you and I feel like the pressure exists actually no matter what you've achieved and where you are in life yeah. um it doesn't it doesn't doesn't seem to be any easier but it's so interesting because I I feel like there's this growing number of people that hit their late 20s or even their mid to late 20s and early 30s and they're just like oh gosh I'm not where I thought I would be or I'm not where I hoped I would be and it's so difficult to deal with that yeah. so I guess what Sunny does is it is it gives us a reminder that we're not alone that, mm. <laughs> that there's so many other people especially women uh 
going through the same thing. And I think that sort of solidarity that comes through in literature is really important. And so why did you decide actually to focus on that age gap, the the age of being 30, rather than, say, the age of being 21? Because that's also, Mm. you know that when you come out of university and you also, especially if you've lived out and you move back home and it looks like your friends all have job offers and some of them are even getting engaged Mm. to their university boyfriends. Like, that's also a very difficult time. Why did you decide that, that you wanted to write about 30? I was approached by my now editor, Mm. Uh, Sarah Nisha Adams that and she kind of came to me with an idea and she said you know I've been following your career and these are the kind of things that you talk about in your stand-up and I think you would make a really good writer like you know you are a good writer and you're a good storyteller I think this would make a good novel and so the things that I talk about in my stand-up it's real life you know it's observational I don't make anything up because you know real life is always much more fun and stranger <laughs> than any sort of fiction right Absolutely. so um so I talk about in my stand-up uh, moving back home with my parents at 30 and you know hiding things from my parents and the, the pressure uh of being a South Asian woman of a certain age like being in my 30s and being single so it kind of made a lot of sense to me to write about a time where I really struggled with all of those things mm. And it was also quite therapeutic because now I'm not in that place, like physically and mentally, I'm not in the place that I was then. And also, I think what you said earlier, you really hit the nail on the head where you said, oh, you know, she's kind of written, I'm paraphrasing, she doesn't make you feel like you're on your own, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that was my main objective in writing Sunny as a character was to go, here's a kind of every woman type character who, you know, is a bit messy you know literally and figuratively and you know it you know can be a bit crabby and can be a bit lazy and and all of those things and is very very imperfect and flawed Mm -hmm. like we all are and we don't really see that representation I find especially with South Asian women Mm -hmm. um you know we're either we were generally quite docile and quite obediently kind of portrayed in in media or or the absolute opposite and have no respect for cultural tradition and have completely left that behind. Yeah. So, you know, and and as you know, we're much more nuanced than that. So here's Sunny who, you know, you do see her going to the Godwara to a Sikh place of worship. You know, you do see her living in a household where her mum is listening to prayers, but you also see her kind of pushing against the kind of boundaries that are placed on her and cultural expectation and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, she's, I think I like to feel she's a bit of all of us, really. Yeah, absolutely, she is, and we see, we do see Sunny really struggle with this sort of like almost double identity, and I think we know that, yeah. like, although it it does come across as a double identity, it's so complicated because it's just one, it's just who we are, but yes. we are slightly different in certain situations, and we're different with our parents, and we're different with our friends, and we're different if we're going out on a date, and I think this sort of you know we're like second generation immigrants our parents came from India or from Pakistan in my case we have this major confusion about our identity Mm. especially growing up when we don't feel Asian enough but we also don't feel British enough and as we as we have grown up and obviously we got we've grown up in a political political climate that's changed so much that's impacted how we relate to identity as people of color and daughters and children of immigrants but what I what I like was that we saw Sunny respect both both of these experiences and she really Mm. tried to kind of make them join up (laughs) and it's it's really it's it's really hard and I wanted to just Mm. talk like hear from you a little bit on that like what Mm. were your experiences growing up and how do you think our relationship to this confusion also changes as we as we have grown up Mm, that's really interesting so I grew up um in quite a religious household and a very traditional quite conservative household much more so than sunny Mm -hmm. both my parents are baptized six so you know I was brought up knowing the prayers going to the god like three four maybe five times a week and I kind of hit an age where I rebelled against it, probably when I was like 14 or 15, because I saw mm. all my friends going out and, <laughs> you know, socialising and having boyfriends. And I was a bit like, oh, 
you know, I felt a bit kind of trapped by it all. And religion to me and seemed like a whole list of things that I couldn't do. It was mm. like, well, oh, these are all the things that are forbidden. The cultural aspect I didn't struggle with as much. So I'm fluent in Punjabi and I, you know, been a, it was my first language as well. And apart from being made to go to Punjabi school every weekend, I didn't really <laughs> struggle with it that much. And I loved traveling to Punjab. And so that part of my background, I strongly identified with. But I also felt like I was missing out on lots mm. of stuff. And so I kind of rebelled and and that kind of lasted for a good few years. And then I kind of hit my mid 20s and I kind of came back round full circle. And I kind of realized that, well, actually, you know, faith is very important to me. And this this does really ground me. And I can kind of pick and choose the parts of Punjabi culture that I like. So, you know, obviously the food, certain rituals and customs are really lovely, the, the the language, the history, but also I never felt comfortable with the way that women are treated in a lot of Punjabi families or a lot of South Asian mm. families and, you know, the, the position of them in the house and the certain expectations like, you know, so growing up it was always the men were fed first. Mm. And then the women eat, the women and children eat later. So all of those things didn't really sit properly with me. Or so I kind of, yeah, I came around full circle, and I then started to appreciate that actually the reason I'd got through life and survived, even with my own mental health and everything, was because I had faith mm. and because of God and and because of the the standing that my parents had in that. So yeah, there was a lot of confusion. Now I definitely celebrate both. Hmm. aspects of myself but now it's obviously more nuanced you know now we're having conversations about immigration and colonialism and South Asia pre and post the Brits you know so now, yeah. it's still kind of evolving isn't it now I can't go to the British Museum because <laughs> it makes me feel a bit ill yeah, yeah absolutely like that there's definitely more space and more conversation that helps us yeah. understand our identities a little bit more and just Definitely. helps us look at it from a different perspective rather than just a list of things that we can and can't do and I think so many people yeah. relate to that like you know I didn't go to sleepovers I couldn't go to parties past like birthday parties even past 9 p.m and mm-hmm. obviously some of those things were because I I had my parents and I as well had certain religious values but some of it was culture mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. and obviously I think the thing about culture and probably more so than religion is that culture changes right it changes yeah. over time and it changes in place as well like if you look mm-hmm. at I mean I won't speak too much about Punjabi families but I know like Pakistani families there is still a marked difference between how Pakistani families do things in the UK and how they do things in Pakistan. Part of that is like geographical difference and availability of food, but the difference mm. is there. And and that too yeah. has changed over time and I think will continue to change. And it's really, mm. uh, really interesting. And actually what I, what I liked the most about the exploration of that in your writing is that so much of what we see in the, me- in the media and sometimes in literature as well it's like a moral judgment that this culture or this thinking or this part of someone's identity, this is wrong or this is backwards. And actually Mm. you say, well, it's not, it's just, it's, it's who Mm. we are. It's there's things that we like and there's things that we don't like, and we don't have to do the things Mm. that we don't like and we can change those things, but it's so much more, as, as you said, it's so much more nuanced. And I really appreciated that kind of, it's not about, rejecting parts or something being wrong yeah this is, this is who we are and it's very complicated yeah absolutely and I think it's very easy to portray it as good or bad and I think especially on screen you know the way that we're all kind of brown people are seen it's like oh you're rather one of the good ones and you're very integrated <laughs> and probably full of some sort of self-loathing or self-hatred or you're one of the bad ones you know and you've not integrated and you're you're still wearing your funny clothes and eating your funny food so you know, that's kind of what it is but then you look at those things and they're either written by white people who have no friends of color yeah. um or family of color and then all they're written by people who have some sort of south asian heritage but have never really been exposed to it you know mm-hmm. and i think class plays a big part in in it as well like mm-hmm. sunny is very working class just like i am very working class so 
there is going to be the cash and carry. There is going to be, you know, the whole money thing about oh, how spending money and feeling guilty about that, and you, there, so and it's living your life in a certain mm. way. And hospitality looks a, a different way when you're working class as well. So I think that's got a big part to play in in seeing her because even I you know I, we don't I don't think we've got any doctors in our family you know I don't mm. think we've got any you know my parents both kind of are, come from farming families yeah you know they came here they did quite manual jobs and so Sunny's parents are not high flyers she doesn't mm. have all these connections in the world and on the other end she does have a, a South Asian friend who is quite connected and who is middle class and you know her friend Anjali who has that so it was nice to kind of, I thought, to show both sides. Yeah. And I think the the class thing also, I mean, it's not really explored in the novel, but it is mm. really, it impacts, I think, um, or in my experience, also the preservation of culture. Because yes. if you, like, when I think about when my parents came in, like, the 70s, when they came mm. and they didn't have any money, what it meant was that they formed a community with other people that were in their situation and everyone helped each other and so what that yeah. meant was that you were living with people that you didn't necessarily know before but these became your family and what, mm-hmm. what tied you together was where you came from and so there yeah. was naturally a preservation of culture that might mm. not exist if you didn't need to rely on people in the way that if you didn't have any money you did and I also think you know that judgment of what will people say I think that yeah. also stems from that because you mm-hmm. needed in in that in that situation you needed people to like you and to respect you yeah. because you needed them to help you survive absolutely and that's i always say that it's almost like quite a tribal thing where it's like well you know when people say oh it's really strict and you can't do this and you can't put a foot out of line and i and i always say that's a survival thing you have to otherwise yeah. you will be in some way sort of shunned and this is kind of like your only lifeline absolutely absolutely you explore really nicely and beautifully in the book friendship now mm. we we are seeing a little bit more of female friendships uh in literature yeah. and and on screen for sure and and I love it because I mean I don't know about you actually I do know about you but in, about me as well <laughs> like female friends are so integral to my life and I cannot say it enough and I've said it probably on so many interviews as well like I absolutely <laughs> I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for my friends that have picked me up Same. when I have been at my at my absolute lowest but what mm. I appreciated through um, Insani is that you you show how, although they're so important, they're also really hard as we grow up and that they change yeah. because we change and we all change in different ways and at different paces and how that affects our friendships. Mm. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like what really inspired the the friendships that you that you put forward in Sunny and what what's your experience of friendships? So Sunny, like me, is an only child and Mm. I didn't grow up. So I grew up on the opposite side of the country to my cousins. So I wasn't one of those Asian kids that, you know, had lots of cousins and they're in and out of each other's houses. And um, so my friends are my family, Mm. essentially. And I went to an all girls school, which meant that it wasn't necessarily a positive experience. So when I left, I was quite wary of other girls, you mm. know, because I was like, oh, are you just going to be really catty and really, you know, like the girls that I went to school with? And not all of them, but the majority of it was like that, quite competitive, quite catty, quite, you know, not very nice. And then slowly I kind of created these kind of female friendships. And there's, I wanted to show, like you said, how we change and how relationships change because we change and how some people don't you know some people you go to uni with or you go to secondary school with and you can meet them 10 years later and they're exactly the same and there's some people who do change and very and and I think I found definitely that friends that I had met in my early 20s by the time we hit 30 because like me my life like Sunny's life was not where I thought it would be and they were doing the traditional thing of you know getting married and having babies and all you know buying houses all of that sort of thing and I found increasingly like Sunny that I was being left out of conversations or I felt Mm. like I was kind of pushed to one side and I wanted to show that kind of erosion of friendship I think there's a a a kind of tendency to show female friendship as you know sometimes being quite toxic or quite problematic or 
you know, they have a big bust up and it's all a bit bitchy and it's all, but mm. I thought, well, how, rather than one big event, why don't, I wanted to show like kind of more gentle erosion mm. of friendship, which is what happens in, I don't want to give too much away in case people haven't read it, but which is what happens in Sunny. It's more of a gentle erosion of things. It's more like the odd thing over time, the odd snide remark, the odd kind of feeling left out and, and all of these things. And then it, it's kind of a more natural, just parting of ways mm. rather than, but I also wanted to show like some quite positive friendships and how friendships can change your life. Like, as we know, like there's certain friends that I've met. So Natalie in the novel is based on my best friend, Emma, who has changed my life, who I met, I think back in 2012. So yeah, just over 10 years ago, mm. we met and she's absolutely changed my life. And, you know, she's a kind of anchor for Sunny. And then you've got Bina who comes in a bit later, who's, you know, Sunny meets quite unexpectedly and really gets on. And Bina's basically who I want to be. So she's yeah. like my <laughs> aspirational, my <laughs> aspirational friend. So yeah, I think you could write like our whole thesis about friendship and especially female friendship and especially the way that we've been taught that we're each other's competition and mm. you, do you know what I mean there's not really I think I love that now we talk more about sisterhood and and kind of you know supporting each other whereas I think if you grow up in the 80s and 90s and even before it's a little bit more competitive and maybe not quite so healthy so mm. I wanted to show like a, a range of different friendships yeah and I mean yeah there were loads of uh different friendships in the book and I loved them all I mean obviously there were also bits where Sunny's friends were not being very good friends to her and that happens yeah. as well but that gentle erosion that you talk about is so like even just listening to you speak like I can feel like a lump in my throat because like it's really it's really it's really sad and it it happens and we almost mm. we almost we it's funny because we do feel it happen but at the same time we don't even notice that it's happening because we're not making a conscious choice so but we we do feel it because we feel that absence that develops and we feel that lack of you know that support or that friend that we had before and in my experience it's only like after when you realize wow I haven't spoken to this person for two years it's yeah. just like what happened like 10 years mm. ago we were so close and it's been two years I don't even know where they are um, yeah and that's re like it's really sad and it's I get again like it's so nice to see it in in a novel because it it reminds you and it shows you that this this is what happens and it happens to lots of people yeah. and it's happening to characters <laughs> people like Sunny um and yeah it's just an appreciation I think of how complicated friendships really mm. can be but also how important like I love Bina I feel like she kind of came in as yeah. like this superwoman almost um, yeah. and not and not without her own baggage right not without her own issues as yeah. well but she came mm. in and she kind of gave Sunny hope and that little bit of a yeah. she needed what Sunny needed was she needed a push was she needed someone to say yeah no you're in a rut we're gonna get you out of this rut this is what mm -hmm. you're gonna do and here are your options and this is what you can do yeah. and I'm here to help you and that's what she came in and we do we do need that I think especially if you don't have like big sisters or you don't mm. live near your friends or you know and you are because yeah. and obviously Sunny's dealing with mental health issues so she's in her head mm -hmm. a lot so yeah. Bina, I feel like gave her this real kind of like literally pull out of a of the little hole that she'd kind of mm. had herself in, like sleeping in. <laughs> so the very yeah, I think it's also about her giving permission to Sunny as well. Mm. You know, mm. to go yeah, you can do this, and her kind of she's done it already. Like she's mm. done, she's made that difficult decision to move out by herself. She's made a non traditional career for herself, so she's kind of leading by example in a way, but without being. I like to think she's not pushy. She's just kind of living her life and just being herself, which mm. gives other people like Sunny permission to be themselves, which I think yeah. is probably the most motivating thing, isn't it? Yeah, really inspiring, isn't it? When you can see someone yeah. just living their life and, and, and doing yeah. so well in it as well. And you also we also see this relationship between Sunny and her mum, which mm. I which I loved because I just felt like it was so sweet but also so difficult like it was in, and and yeah. this is how also my experience of a mother-daughter relationship is with my own mom like 
you're just you you feel like you don't understand each other you feel like they don't understand you and then you wonder like is it because they don't care about me and it's just Mm. like it was antagonizing at at times but then there's that really sweet moment where Sunny is in need of somebody to help her Mm. she's and she's really upset and she's gotten herself in this awkward situation really upset and she calls her mom and her mom's just like I'm coming to get you and her mom comes with food and it's just a love yes. language right it's a love yeah it's just so so kind of hearty and such a mm. reminder that sometimes people express love in different ways yeah um, and that also mother-daughter relationships are not straightforward um no, what did you really want to uh portray w- with their relationship I think um so Sunny's mum is quite fairly similar to my own mum in the sense that my mum will never sit down and go, I'm really proud of you. Well done. You've mm. done very well. <laughs> um, and for years, because I was comparing her to uh, the ideals of a Western mum, I was like, oh, she doesn't care about me. She must not love me because she doesn't say I love you. And she doesn't. But she's there for me when it counts. But she's she, but she's there for me in the way that she kind of you know she'll hug me when I come in and go you're cold you need to wear warmer clothes or you know have you eaten or what about this or you know so I always used to take it as a criticism but it's actually her showing that she cares you know she'd be like oh you've got dark circles under your eyes and I'd be like oh for god's sake like you know and and she's actually saying no you need to go to sleep earlier or you need Mm. to drink more water you need to do this so as I kind of got older I've appreciated that our parents can only do what they can do with what they know and as difficult as we might find it with our parents they had it a lot worse than we did so you know and going back I'm sure it was the same so they're just kind of trying to give us a better life than they had and obviously they don't get it right and there comes that point where you realize that oh my parents are people as well like they're not Mm -hmm. just my parents they are people in their own right and they are also flawed and they also make mistakes and they also get it wrong I think with Sunny's mum because Sunny's quite kind of like you said she lives in her head a lot she's kind of in at the beginning of the novel especially it's like yeah this is who mum is and and obviously there's stuff where you you know um Sunny's mum is like oh god you know so and so's got married and you're still not married and maybe you need to go on this matrimonial show or and why can't you drive and or you know this this outfit's a bit too tight for you you've put on weight and you know and so obviously there's stuff like that which is difficult but there's also a lot of love there and also a lot of, you know, care and a lot of emotion. And, and I like to think Sunny's mum goes on her own journey yeah, as well, like throughout it. And they do have some like really tender moments. And I think the, the difficulty with having this double identity is that in order to survive, sometimes we compartmentalise our life and we're like, well, this is my outside life and this is my home life and never mm. the train shall meet. And you know, there is that moment where the two collide for Sunny and she's then forced to open up. I think that's quite a, um, that can be quite de- detrimental, can't it, if, when we do that? And I think sometimes we don't give our parents enough credit, you know, when Sunny's mum is like, I know what you've been doing. Like, you live <laughs> under my roof. Like, you've got to, like, I'm your mum, I know. So I think the kind of, I wanted to show the blossoming of that relationship without making it twee or to Disney or anything, you know, it's not like at the end, the mum's going to be like, oh, go, go live your life, do this, you know, you know, even at certain, you know, she's still, it's a process, like they both are who they are, but that relationship could have definitely used some work. And I like to feel like by the end of it, it's definitely improved for both of them. Yeah, definitely. And we see, I mean, and I do think, like when I think back to my own life as well, when uh, we face a lot of criticism from our parents and growing up, it's really hard to deal with that. Mm. Like I, I had it a lot and I still, I mean, I still get yeah. it. Yeah, and it is really hard. But one of the things that help is communication. Yeah. And when you're younger, it's really difficult to be able to say this thing is hurtful. Yeah, and of course. This is how I'm feeling, and you can't. And you, I mean, it's hard to do it even now, but especially when you're yeah. you're young, especially because you yourself don't don't even know. Like, mm. I remember like being a teenager and like feeling as though I needed to lash out and not really knowing why, and all these like frustrations mm. and like feeling sad and not under- fully understanding why, but just knowing that something wasn't right. And then to have parents that completely don't understand it 
because so much of their life has been about survival and they've got, yeah and for them it's like well you're lucky you can go to school because we never got the chance to go and that brings guilt like it's very very yep. com- it's very very complicated and, and I mm. I really liked that uh really enjoyed that exploration um in the book and definitely I think there was improvement in their relationship and that the mum she did change she realized yeah. that she had to un- get to understand her daughter a little bit more and she had to let mm-hmm. go of some of the things that she was holding on to um, but the other thing I wanted to say was that you know the the mean comments that um that that Sunny experienced and I'm sure you did and I I did too mm. um about our weight and about us I used to yeah. get it a lot about our skin color like oh don't go outside yeah. it's going to get really dark I used to get mm-hmm. that quite a lot but they also come from a place that is not a place of wanting to hurt you or a place of anger or yeah. resentment it comes from a place of protection i think mm. yeah they have, absolutely and 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 i it took me a long time to to kind of think about it in this way but i do think that when we have an a community that immigrates to another place they think about how they need to survive in that place and they think about what is going to make make people like you and accept yeah. you and for them someone that is uh slim and fair mm. and polite and um successful in their career and successful in education like all of these things are going to make people like us and accept us yeah. and so when we don't do those things they're just like oh my goodness you're going to be rejected by society and that's going to be absolutely awful but it yeah. took me a long time to be able to think about it in that way yeah. I don't know if you had a similar experience or not yeah definitely I think a lot of because like Sunny I always had comments like about my weight and stuff and definitely skin color and you know it would be it would be like a hot day and my mum would be like just put, just put a little cardigan on or just put you know because you're wearing short sleeves or whatever or or just make sure that you don't stay in the sun too long and I think a lot of that was projection mm. when it came from my mum it was a lot of like I don't want you to have to go through what I went through being a bigger woman and not being like conventionally attractive obviously it's hurtful and it takes a, a lot of work and to get to the place where you go you don't know any better yeah like this is where you're at and of course like you said when you're a kid or when you're a teenager or whatever or even in your early 20s you don't have the words mm-hmm. you know to to communicate it and you know I see sometimes I see these like TikToks or um Instagram posts where they're like just talk to your parents if they <laughs> hurt you and then it's stitched with like a South Asian creator going <laughs> I can't really do that which is why we need more South Asian therapists but um that aside I think you know there came a point when I first moved home in my when I was 30 and I my mum made a comment I was wearing a dress it was summer and I was wearing a dress and she I was walk. I kind of bid her good night as I was turning around to walk away she said oh you can really see your back fat in that dress now that's a throwaway comment that she would have made so many times to Mm. me before Mm. and I remember just stopping in the kitchen and I just remember going my heart was going like a million miles an hour and I was like (laughs) I could say something about this now I've just moved back I do Mm. not want to get back into this kind of toxic cycle of you know making comments about my way and stuff and I thought I could say something or I could move away like I remember really clearly having that choice and I turned around don't get me wrong I was terrified Mm. and I turned around and I was like i remember I was like I have to say this with love I cannot I don't Mm. want to get into an argument about it and I just said mum I love you and I think you are perfect the way that you are Mm. I would never say that to you what you've just said to me oh and it's making me a bit emotional actually as I'm talking about it and I said I said I know that you love me as well Mm. and you think that I'm perfect the way that I am so I, I said um I'd really appreciate it if you didn't make those kind of comments and then I gave her a huge hug Hmm. and then I went to bed and then obviously I went upstairs and went oh (laughs) because it's terrifying because you know I'm like am I gonna get like proper Punjabi mum who's gonna be like give me a backhander or am I gonna (laughs) get am I gonna get the silent treatment from her where she's like you don't talk to me like this like what am I gonna get but and and since then 
yeah, there might have been the odd comment. I mean, that was like what eight, nine, almost nine years ago. But it's kind. It seems to have done the trick. Not to say that I've got the solution to it, but you know that was one of those real turning points in our relationship. Wow, wow, that oh, I can imagine that must have taken so much for you to do it, but also to do it in the way that you did it, and not to just be like, "Mom, that's so mean." That's I would have been like, "Mom, that's so mean." I can't believe you say that to me. I'm your daughter. Don't you love me? That's the kind yeah. of thing I would have ended up taking. <laughs> so. But that, that had been me up until that point and I was like you just don't love me then like, what you just want a perfect daughter and I'm not the perfect daughter and that comes with time with age with also like processing your feelings because although it is also about how your mom feels about you and therefore how you feel about how your mom feels about you but it's also about how you feel about you yeah. And if that and if th- this is what we're constantly hearing is these negative comments that, you know, to your mum may or to anybody else may just seem like throwaway tiny remarks. But for us, they kind of like chip away, chip away, chip away. Yeah, it takes. Yeah, it just it really takes it, its toll on us. And actually talking about toll on us, you also write about mental health. And Sunny, Sunny mm-hmm. has a mental health. You know, she has depression and but she doesn't really know. But in the beginning, we kind of see her, you know, just kind of wanting to, she talks about that she just wants to lie down and watch TV and eat. Yeah. She talks about going to Sainsbury's and getting like a share bag of chocolates. I can't remember which one it is, yeah. but yeah. And I was yeah. like, oh my gosh, that is actually, that is me. And that is still me some days. Um, yeah. And um, so you portray it, you, you, you portray it in a really human and soft way that makes us realize that you know she isn't okay and she's yeah. she's more okay in cert- at certain times and that's what depression is it's not about constantly mm-hmm. feeling like that is it like there are there of are course. times when you're struggling with your mental health that you are absolutely fine or you feel yeah. better and then there are times when you just can't get out of bed and we see it with Sunny like she mm-hmm. she sleeps a lot she's lethargic yeah. she's tired and I know when I've been in that situation, I'm always like, maybe my vitamin D is low, maybe my iron is yeah. low. Like, it can't be my mental health, it must be these other things. Yeah. Um. But what was, what for you was the kind of the most important thing and the driving factor behind um, representing mental health? I think I wanted to show that there are so many people out there that are, look like they're functioning, that look like they're reading quote unquote normal lives. And behind closed doors, they're not. And I think we can really sometimes gaslight ourselves when it comes to mental health. Like you gave a prime example there where you're like, oh, maybe it's just vitamin D. Maybe it's just this. Mm. Maybe it's just that. And we're very good at uh, brushing aside, you know, the symptoms of it. And I think there's also, I mean, there's a lot more education now around what, you know, depression looks like or anxiety looks like. But sometimes you can go oh yeah well of course I'm depressed because look at the state of the world like it's also bloody hopeless like of Mm -hmm. course of course I'm gonna feel like this and because depression is seen as there's it's always quite extreme kind of you know portrayals of depression say on tv or in novels and stuff but this kind of low level day to day I'm exhausted I don't want to do anything my thoughts are on a kind of negative loop I'm probably eating more I'm sleeping more I don't you know don't really feel anything I don't really want to make an effort with my appearance so you know all of these all like um you know having a messy room or having a messy flat or whatever so all of these things these are can all be symptoms of depression and I think um that's partly based on I didn't realise that I've basically been depressed all my life until I went into therapy and she gave it a name Mm. because I just thought, A, this is just what I'm like because I've been like this for years. So I just thought, well, it's just my personality. Some people are naturally sunny and happy all the time and some Mm. people aren't. And I was like, well, maybe that's me. And secondly, I, I, you know, I didn't realise that depression could also mean not wanting to go out when it's sunny, just wanting to sit in your bed or lie in bed and have the curtains closed Mm. I didn't realize that it could be also feeling absolutely exhausted and not wanting to go to work and oh I also didn't realize that I would 
you know, it's easier to say, and I think Sunny does this as well, it's easier to say to your friends, oh, I'm coming down with something, I've got a cold, than to say, I do that. You know, yeah, than to say, do you know what? I'm really struggling with my mental health and it's, I I can't even get up from the sofa. Mm. So I wanted to show that kind of almost quite kind of mundane day day to day kind of thing of it partly because that was based on my own experience really and I talk about it in my stand-up a lot as well where I talk about you know going to a therapist and her going I'm depressed and and I was like well of course I'm depressed like I'm single I live at home like I'm in my 30s you know I haven't been on a date in years like you know (laughs) writing my overdraft of course I'm depressed who wouldn't be depressed you know (laughs) so I think there's yeah so I kind of wanted to show that kind of side of it Mm. more than more than anything else yeah and I I liked it because it wasn't like um dramatized in the in the novel it wasn't like a you didn't make a song and dance about it like it was integral to understanding the character and Mm. following her in her journey but it it wasn't something that was sometimes we see mental health brought in just kind of as like a tick box or something to add a bit of flair but actually this was this is part of the character and it's so real and so kind of human as well because when you are at that age and things are not going right for you and you are struggling and you're losing your friends and you are not having a successful dating life and actually like it's it's not even about whether or not your dating life is successful it's that feeling of not having a companion and being lonely and being so worried about your future because you're just like if I'm not successful now am I going to be successful in the next few years and if I'm not and you spiral you spiral like I'm going to stay single forever I'm not going to have any kids I'm going to be like living (laughs) in an apartment with like seven cats like that's the thing right like that's a spiral I remember <laughs> saying, like, during these points, like, because I, I still spiral, mm. like, rarely now, but it still happens. And I remember spiraling when I turned 30 and obviously I moved home with my parents and I was speaking to the real life Natalie on yeah. the phone. And I said, oh, this I'm never going to leave home and I'm never going to be able to buy a house because look at the economy and no one's <laughs> ever going to want to be with me because why would they? And I hate men and, and you know, what I hate, you know, and at the time, like I wasn't really create, do, doing anything creative as well. Mm. And I was like, and I've got no money. And I said, all that's going to happen is I'm going to I'm going to stay with my parents and then I'm going to be one of those weirdos who lives with their parents until they're like 50. And then <laughs> I'm going to go on like a walking tour holidays and like, <laughs> she just went babe let me stop you she said you hate walking that's never gonna happen and that's what a good friend does exactly <laughs> that that it's gentle you bringing you back yeah, to earth in the bar <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me that's so brilliant and like in your in your writing and also like in your in your career you as a comedian you you draw on so many of your own life experiences everything I feel like for you is autobiographical and how like what what's that like like I I'm in awe every time I hear your comedy I mean I always find it so relatable and hilarious I'm always in stitches but I also feel like oh my god she's been so vulnerable and so open how what's that like for you I think I realized a few years ago that if you tell your truth you give other people permission to tell their truth Mm -hmm. and that courage or bravery is not necessarily about an absence of fear it's about kind of pushing through the fear Mm -hmm. you know and kind of doing it anyway and when I realized that we're all connected in some sort of way and actually all we're looking for I'm sorry this is going quite deep but all we're looking for is like love and acceptance and self-acceptance and I think a lot of us go around going, well, no one else has got these problems. It's just me. Like, I definitely was like that as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just me. Everybody else has got a great life on the set, especially like when you look at Instagram or you look at your socials and everyone else is just like this perfect highlights reel. And then as soon as I started talking about the more deeper subjects like mental health or like you know, being single and kind of not feeling great about that. Um, women, mainly women, came up to me at the end of the sh- come up to me at the end of my set or at the end of my show and go, "Oh my god, I'm so glad you're talking about this. I thought I was the only one," and that's what really spurred me on. So my last show was called um, "Life Sucks," 
and we did it. <laughs> we started it early 2020 before we knew what was going to happen. Yeah. And I remember going on stage and my knees shaking because it was the first time I'd spoken really vulnerably about mental health. Mm. And the way I did it in my show was I went chat, 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 talk about your mom, talk about being Punjabi, talk about, you know, living at home. And then it was almost like an emergency break in the mid, like about, a qu- yeah, I know a quarter of the way through. So I've got about three or 400 Punjabis specifically in pretty much in the audience. Mm. And I'm going, right, let's talk about mental health. And you can feel all their butts clench. <laughs> you can feel they all go, we don't talk about this. Um, and I talk about the fact that we don't talk about stuff. You know, mm-hmm. I say, you know, that growing up, my mum, and this is true, my mum would say, Gardi gal kisigolni garni, you know, mm-hmm. you don't tell outsiders your business at all. And then you're expected to go to therapy. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> this does not fit. And And at the end of that show, and I'll never forget, this this gentleman came up to me and it always makes me a bit emotional when I think about it and he was like a, a six foot tall sick Punjabi guy with a turban a beard like the last person that I thought would relate to what I was talking about and he came up to me and he kind of shook my hand and I think he was with his wife or he was with other people and they went to one side and he just kind of leant in and he whispered um I'm going to therapy but no one knows Oh. And thank you so much for talking about it. And I remember just getting, and I'm like, I get, I get choked up every time I think about it. Here is somebody that you think would be the last person who would be vulnerable or emotional or, you know, going to therapy. And I just thought, wow, we really are more similar than we think. Like, we mm-hmm. really do. All of us have a lot in common, regardless of who we are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that kind of spurred me on to really talk about and to have more confidence in what I was saying Mm. and talking about not just mental health but also talking about you know how crappy it is when um you're being judged by your peers because Mm. you're single because you're single and they're all married and they're like oh gosh you're not married you know and all of that kind of judgment and how that can really get to you and yeah I like to talk about the the not so pretty parts of like the human condition really like you know the (laughs) fact that we all get quite jealous and the fact that we can want to be a bit catty sometimes and Mm. and especially the the vulnerable side yeah wow thank you so much for sharing that and I I mean I have no doubt that it's not easy like it's not easy to open up about yourself and to share some of your deepest darkest thoughts and feelings and experiences and I'm sure you probably have raging anxiety at times and imposter syndrome and I'm not (laughs) like you know I that's the thing that I know that it's not easy and it makes me respect what you do and respect you even more because you're right like it's definitely important in it it opens up conversation like if someone is on Mm. stage as you are and on tv talking about these things of course we need to normalize it and I think what yeah what I like the most about what you what you talk about is is the fact that these are all things that cause us pain like you know how how you feel when your friends are moving on and how the comments that they make about you being single or like yeah. sometimes you know I hear comments people make about you know I don't have children yet and those kind of things and those are really deeply painful and when you're yeah. going through it you don't know how to process your pain you don't know how to place it in a larger mm. context and you feel like well everyone else has got lots of things going on but you're here going you know what let's talk about it we're easy to talk about it and this is what happens and it's horrible yeah. and actually people need to think about what they say and how they say it and all of this and I yeah. absolutely I think it's so brilliant and so important so thank you so much thank for you. everything that that you do and how oh, how you. do you how did you as a comedian how did that affect your writing and your writing of Sunny and your decision to all the decisions you must have made throughout that writing process in terms of writing stand up or writing Sunny writing Sunny but writing Sunny I think um I don't know I think for me I felt like I didn't have a choice but to tell the truth hmm. So it wasn't necessarily a conscious decision where I was like, oh, I can make up this fantastic cast of characters that have nothing to do. So I don't know how people, how writers or creators just go, oh, I'm going to make up this incredible universe with 
you know, dragons and fairies and witches and wizards. And I'm like, oh my God, really? <laughs> that is, that's amazing. Like, I would not even know where to create that universe, you know? Yeah. So Sunny is very much my universe, you mm. know, a slightly different version of it. And I'm not 100% like her and her life is not 100% like mine. But, you know, for me, telling the truth just seemed to be the right thing to do the natural thing to do I think yeah I think that's a better word it's not the natural thing to do I felt like I as a person don't want to live with a mask Mm. and I feel like for a lot of my life I did Mm. pretending to be someone else obviously we code switch as well with different people with our families and our parents and who we are outside but I think there's so much shame Mm. when you do not follow the path that is or you know follow the life that you should follow or you know when you don't meet the expectations of your family or your community and I feel like shame only really flourishes when there's secrecy Mm. so I kind of wanted to put all that out there and go here look and it's my way I guess of not giving something back but my way of kind of helping people in whatever small way to feel seen Mm. and that's what I really want out of Sunny and that's what I really want out of my stand-up as well for people to go it's the biggest compliment when someone goes oh my god that's so relatable Mm. because anyone can be funny I think you know loads of people are funny but to do something to to connect to bring people together to make people feel less alone I think is something really special Mm. and that's kind of really what I strive to do and the other thing that I always want to do in my work is to show specifically South Asian women who are not following the the path that has been laid out for them Hmm. yeah thank you that oh that's really that's made me feel really like teary now (laughs) that's really sweet and actually like it's so it's so nice to hear that's kind of your aim in life and you know I wish you every every goodness and all the best with it because I know I know that like women like me and and my friends we find deep kind of solace and community in knowing that other people are going through this and that there's a woman out there who's encouraging us to talk about it but not just you don't just encourage people to talk about it you encourage societies and communities to think about things differently also you are a comedian and and an actor and you are a minority within a minority like not only are you a female comedian you are a female comedian of color like you're an an Indian woman um Mm. what what has been your experiences in trying to to get seen and I think what I'm really interested actually do you feel like as being an Indian female comedian that you're expected to talk about certain things and do certain things that's an interesting one I think there's a lot of when I first started firstly women in comedy there's still the this belief that women aren't funny Mm. and then Asian women in comedy you're like a bit of a unicorn right because there's, (laughs) there's so few of us and you know thankfully that's changing even in the short time that I've I've been doing it there are more women of colour who are coming up in comedy which is fantastic I find that my main issue was really you know applying for gigs Hmm. and the white male promoters going yeah we've already got a woman on the lineup Hmm. so (laughs) that idea that women are a minority even though we make up (laughs) half the population yeah so came up up against that a lot Mm. Um, I feel most at home doing gigs on the Disney comedy circuit because mm. that you know I'll do other ones as well and obviously you know work is work but I love doing the Disney comedy circuit because that is when I feel like I'm with my people I can be really open and when I say Disney comedy I mean like you know the comedians are generally um South Asian mm. and the audience is majority South Asian although not always mm. you know it's it can be quite a mixed crowd mm. which is really lovely and what's so nice is you know and I know we must have grown up feeling like this so I definitely grew up feeling like this where it's like mm, yeah, it's nice and it's funny and I can laugh at that and it's great, but no one's really speaking to me. Mm. And I find that with a lot of South Asian audiences, they'll go to stuff and they'll go, 
or they won't go because they'll go oh it's not for us mm. you know it's not really something we do so what's really lovely is you're bringing comedy to an audience that may not have seen a comedy show before mm. um and definitely wouldn't have gone out of their way to see a female comedian mm. and obviously we come with our with our kind of own perspective comedy i find in terms of the industry quite difficult because it's very male dominated and the men are in a position of power which has led to a lot of abuses of power so there's been lots of gigs that I've done where I've heard or I've seen things that are not okay that are not appropriate that are you know certain kind of places where you would not feel safe as a woman yeah and there's a lot of that and so as a result of that I've kind of taken a bit of a step back from it because I'm like I can't go on stage or you know be backstage or be in a green room with a comedian who I know has behaved inappropriately towards women or who has assaulted a woman or has never been brought to justice or anything or or, Mm -hmm. you know has used their position as somebody on tv to um take advantage Mm -hmm. of women as well so yeah comedy I find difficult in terms of that but at the same time I find it a wonderful medium to talk about things and Mm -hmm. to reach a large group of people that you wouldn't normally reach and also because I am a show-off so Mm. I need to do like one gig a week to kind of scratch my show-off gene so it's not all doom and gloom (laughs) yeah oh that's great and do you have any tips for any women uh, especially South Asian women who might feel like they want to get into comedy but are are scared because obviously it's it's a bit of a minefield isn't it what would be your advice of course um, of course, yeah, if you're not scared, you're silly. Like, you should be scared <laughs> of doing it. It is the most terrifying thing. There is no safety net. But it is that classic thing of give it a go. Find an open mic night in your local area. Take a friend along, Um, you know, for support. Write five minutes. It doesn't have to be a great five minutes. And something I've always struggled with is um fear of failure. Mm. And um, so I, if something doesn't quite land right, or I, I get really annoyed about it. But all of the comedians, especially all the great comedians, you know, they'll all die. They've all died on stage at some point, you know. Yeah. So go somewhere, <laughs> and if you're like, oh no, I live in a small town, go somewhere where nobody knows you, mm. <laughs> because that way, if you mess up, no one's ever going to see you. Write five minutes, um, know it inside out as much as you can and go there and perform it and take it from there Mm. you know comedy can be a part of your life in so many ways you can make it a career it can be something that you do alongside your nine to five it can be something that you develop over time like there's no one kind of route to it Mm. you know some people purely do on do it online some people Mm. purely do it on tiktok and then have no interest in doing it live so Mm. there are so many ways to be creative and to use comedy and now there are so many open mics that you can do you know there are uh, forums on facebook um that you you know they're looking for new apps or they're looking for new material Mm. and yeah it can be a really steep learning curve so Mm. go in there with your material with some humility and just do it and honestly it's five minutes and five minutes it is nothing mm. like it's absolutely nothing so yeah it is terrifying but I think embrace that fear and know it's going to be scary there's nothing wrong with it being terrifying some of the most amazing performers in the world have gone on stage actors with a bucket backstage that they can throw up into before oh. they go on stage because they get such bad stage fright so if you're oh. scared it doesn't mean that you're not cut out for it I get terrified every time I go on stage mm. every single time and I've been you know doing this for years now god like <clears throat> so mm. yeah just honestly if you really want to do it give it a go don't put the pressure on yourself to be perfect just say what you want to say don't mm. try and be anyone else oh, you know I'm... say what you want to say that's so great. And I, I'm sure a lot of people will find comfort in your advice. And I think that goes for a lot of other fields, probably all life decisions and all work, really, that you're going to be scared. It's totally fine to be yeah. scared. But but you do you and yeah. you take it easy and go at the pace that you need to go at. And so on the surface of it, like when we think about a comedian and we think about an author, we probably don't see them as being the same person unless someone's writing like a memoir 
but actually yeah. obviously there is writing involved in comedy because you need to write your own jokes and your own shows and skits and and what have you but for you what was it like becoming an, a novelist like have you always written outside of comedy or did you did you ever think that you'd become an author like yeah how did you kind of move from writing your stage stuff to writing a book yeah honestly I thought I'd write a book when I was about 60 and had like nothing better to do <laughs> like that was the thing I was like I'm gonna be one of those you know slightly unhinged old women who wear a lot of linen and wear like really <laughs> chunky jewelry live by the sea probably take a younger lover um and then I'll write on my old vintage typewriter before I go to the bakery and get a baguette or whatever. So, like, I thought that was going <laughs> to... Um, so when my editor, Sarah Adams, came to me and she was like, write a book. And I think it... I don't think it would have worked had it not been lockdown mm. because it was a few months into lockdown and we were... And then we just got to the point when we realised that this was not going to be over very soon. Mm. And all my work had stopped. And she was the one, really, who said you're a fantastic storyteller go for it and I've written a play before I've written like sketches for tv before it's by far the hardest thing I've written because when you write a play or when you write your stand-up like you've got the script like even if you're writing a script but there's so much that's filled in by the performer mm. you know your facial expressions your you know what you're doing physically or you know your interactions with other people so um I'm a chronic underwriter so mm. I would be like you know for example Sunny walked into a room and then I'd just carry on and, and Sarah would say to me yeah but like what kind of room like what color <laughs> are the walls what color you know mm. who's in there what's the temperature like and I'd be like come on like you could just figure it out like <laughs> you need to just fill in the gaps and then I was like oh it's and now I really have to paint a picture and I can purely use words and and I found it at times incredibly difficult to do that and um with everything that was going on and we didn't really know when I had no work coming in and uh and then I was terrified because obviously I, I also have anxiety terrified um that I would get a call from my publishers going yeah we've made a huge mistake with like the advance back so uh... or we we've received the latest draft of, of your manuscript it's terrible no one's going to read this sorry <laughs> we've changed our mind and I think like anything when you do it for the first time you just don't know it's a really steep learning mm. curve so I'm learning how to write a book as I'm writing it I hadn't done any creative writing courses or anything I hadn't mm. really written anything long form Mm. so um yeah it was a lot tougher than like I realized I was like oh my god this is a slog and this is a, a universe that I know really well imagine if I was writing about dragons and wizards and stuff well, <laughs> that would be so much harder so yeah that was the the process was kind of quite tough but also quite um therapeutic especially because Sunny's based on you know loosely based on how I felt when I turned 30 and then mm. I'm writing it when I was how old was I 30 six thirty seven. So it was nice to kind of go, Oh, you felt like that then and but look at you now. Like you're <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, you've oh. you know, you've yeah. moved on. Oh, that's so nice. Just before we leave, I wondered if uh, obviously like Sunny has a interesting dating life experience. Mm. And I know from your social media that you have also and I wondered if you would leave our listeners with a short anecdotal funny story just to lift spirits in this miserable winter that we're still in if if you're comfortable yes <laughs> absolutely yeah oh my god absolutely so this is one that I've, I've told quite a few times so I know it quite well so I was probably around 23 hmm. and I had not really figured out how to weed out the you know the bad guys from the good guys yeah hmm. And um, I'd met this guy online and his photos weren't very clear. So now I know that that's a huge red flag. Yeah. And we met at a pub near um, London Bridge and we'd had a bit of a chat and we'd not talked on the phone or anything because I didn't really realise how important that was back then. Mm. So I'm waiting for him in the pub. He messages me. He's like, oh, I'm running late. And he turns up almost half an hour late. Mm. And obviously by this time I've settled in and I've got a drink and he turns up, he's 
I think he must have originally had curly hair, but he's straightened it really badly. So it kind of looks like it's crimped, you know, oh, like back in the 80s yeah. when he's had crimped hair. And he's kind of like, he's wearing like, he just looks really odd. He's wearing what looks like trousers from like a suit. Oh, okay. But with, but with like a Metallica t-shirt and like a plastic leather jacket. What? Okay. Like a pleather jacket. <laughs> and and he's got like a record bag. Do you remember record bags? Like no. in the nineties, like we used to have like those big old bags that we used to work take to school. And I was oh, like, okay, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. So he turns up and he kind of spots me and he's like, oh hi. Doesn't apologize for being late, and he doesn't ask me what I'm drinking. He just points at my drink and he goes, oh, I would have got you a drink, but you've already got one, haven't you? <laughs> goes to the bar by himself, right? Comes back sits next to me like a psychopath like not opposite me like a normal person sits next to me and I'm like doing that thing where I'm kind of like you know your neck starts hurting after a while because you're kind of cricking your neck going to look at them so I'm really uncomfortable I can't remember what we talked about but it was really boring at one point I was like I'm gonna go to the loo so I go to the loo I come back he's on the phone he's talking to his cat He's called his flatmate because he wants to talk to his cat. Oh. I and then we we chat some more, and then out of nowhere, mid sentence, he kind of just lunges at me. What? As if to <laughs> as if to kiss me, <laughs> and I was so panicked because I'm obviously so not feeling this at all that I um basically face palmed him. Oh. I got my hand and I went no. <laughs> You know, like what you do to a puppy or like, I was like, no, like that. And all credit to him, he did not break his stride at all. And he just went, oh, okay, so you're just not ready yet. Like this. Not like Uh, embarrassed uh, or I'm sorry or anything. Anyway, uh, then he insists. That is a level of confidence, you know. (laughs) I know, a level of confidence that he should not have possessed. (laughs) And then he insists on walking me to the tube and I'm like oh god it's like a good 10-15 minute walk to the tube now we make like more awkward conversation I get on the train I go home and I'm like oh god that was horrendous and I go to the little Tesco because I'm like I need I need um like some sort of comfort food now to like buy myself some chocolate to console myself and I open my purse and there's a tenner missing (gasps) When I went to the loo, I didn't take my bag with me because I didn't want him oh to think that goodness. I was taking drugs or anything or, I don't know, was on my period or whatever. So I left my handbag <laughs> with him. Oh, my gosh. He robbed yeah. you? Yeah, he robbed me. <laughs> what? Oh, my goodness. He barely paid for the drink that he bought. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he like, I would invoice her, but... um. Oh, my good. Oh, wow. Did you hear from him again? I think, yeah, I think he did message me again, just being like, oh, I'm really surprised I've not heard from you. And I was like, really? Wow. I was like, oh, I think we want different things. Block. <laughs> oh, wow, thank you. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I wasn't expecting it to go the way that it went. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I realise it's probably not that funny. It's more dark and just bizarre, <laughs> isn't it? But it is also very funny. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for taking the time out to speak to me today is honestly it's been so wonderful I've loved every moment of it and oh actually do you have another book in the pipeline I do I do I'm working on the difficult second album oh yeah yeah, so I've changed my idea about three times at this point (laughs) but I've finally got one that I'm sticking to it is um I can't say too much but it is a little bit different to Sunny, still a female mm. protagonist, still South Asian, mm. um, and still a woman that is doing what um, what she shouldn't be doing, really. <laughs> What's not expected of her. Love to see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and do, do you have uh, like a, a timeline? Ne- maybe yeah, I'd li- um, yeah I'd, I'd like to kind of get it published next year. Okay. Oh. so yeah I'm gonna I, I'm kind of plowing my way through my first vomit draft right oh. now which is for my eyes only obviously no one's gonna see it because it's yeah. horrendous <laughs> but um but yeah it was the ideal would be to get it you know the ideal would I think would be to publish a book every couple of years that would that would be so lovely 
yeah a lot of work though a lot of work so yeah a lot of work (laughs) but I can't wait I will definitely uh keep an eye out and yeah I can't wait um but yeah thank you so much for thank you this has been such a joy thank you Thank you so much to Sook for such a fun, insightful and warm conversation. I loved every moment and I hope you do too. If you enjoyed the podcast, please follow The Diverse Bookshelf on your podcast platform of choice and connect with me on social media. I would really appreciate it if you could rate and leave a review as it helps more people find the podcast.